starting out with straight facts. I don't lie in my raps. Hunter Biden smoke. The Democrats know that. Biden ain't with Jack. The name is Barack. He a little B like the pack. The earth might be flat. All right, so Ken, I wanted to talk to you. I got the email and I wanted to talk to you, obviously, about what happened in Pennsylvania. And before we get into it, why don't you go ahead and tell the audience um, which presidents you worked under, what your official roles were, just so we can sort of, you know, get an idea of your level of expertise. Because, you know, I watched some stuff last night and people are complaining about, you know, expertise in these things around the story and that they don't think a lot of people are qualified. You are. So why don't you go ahead and tell people about your background? Well, thank you. And, and I appreciate being on your show. Uh, my background is that I retired from the U.S. Secret Service after 24 years of service. Um, I rose to the rank of special agent in charge of the Dignitary Protective Division in Washington. And I served on the presidential protective detail for 10 years uh, with three sitting presidents, President Clinton, President George W. Bush, and then President Obama. Now, obviously, this sort of thing has not happened in a very, very long time. What would you say, do you have any distinct you know, memories or experiences from your time during these operations that stand out to you, or maybe people don't know about it, whatever you're allowed to talk about, where something was a close call, you guys discovered something, you prevented something, anything like that. Is there something that we might hear about in your book that people would be shocked to hear about your time on these details? Perhaps, uh, you know, they're, <laughs> they're, you know, close calls uh, is, a, is an interesting term. And, and of course, one, someone's close call is, is someone else's awesome failure. So I, I think uh, in terms of close calls, 9-11 was, uh, was a close call for us. And, and I do detail in the book our actions on the night of 9-11 uh, when we had to evacuate President Bush and, and Laura Bush from the White House uh, with the threat of an airplane uh, that was loose in the sky uh, headed straight for the White House. And a lot of people don't know about that, but it, it is not uh, classified in any way. Uh, it turned out to be an Air Force jet that was um, that was on the wrong frequency and didn't have a, a transponder going. But uh, nevertheless, um, much like what you saw Saturday, uh, we took unprecedented action to to you know to uh, prevent uh, the president from being in harm's way. And so we did e e effect a, an evacuation that night uh, from the White House. And and so that doesn't happen except in training. And what you saw Saturday uh, has never happened either when uh, the president uh, is under a hail of bullets and, and the protective detail has to react to that. And, um, you know, on, on some levels, that's going to be called a failure because they were put in a position to have to react uh, versus uh, the action of prevention, which is where we would prefer to live. To definitely, I would say. <laughs> I would have to agree with that. Um, in terms of Saturday... This claim that's now coming up, and I'd like to focus on some of the facts and then get your perspective on the stuff to try to fill in some of the blanks. Obviously, this is speculation. But the Secret Service director saying that this was a safety concern, the sloped roof, and they wanted to uh, secure the building from the inside, I believe are the words she used. Is that In your experience, would that be the typical response? And would you say that was a reasonable response and I know you weren't there, but would you have done it differently if you're able to make a suggestion like that? Yeah, I'm not sure what she's responding to or what information she was given, but um, but a sloped roof is not a good enough reason not to place someone up there. Having said that, that would not be my first choice either. I, I think posting that roof with an officer poses risks to an officer that are unnecessary because done correctly, you would post multiple officers on the ground outside that building that prevents uh, plan A is to prevent uh, anyone, especially someone with a weapon, from gaining access to that high ground overlooking a secured venue. So prevention is plan A. And, and because action is faster than reaction, plan A to prevent uh, is what should have been focused upon. It should have been um, executed upon. And, uh, and nevertheless, you, you, you train and you practice for plan B, which is, which is what you saw. Now, in terms of communications between 
agents. This is something I've heard people ask a lot about. What is the communication level between, let's say, Secret Service on the ground, snipers, maybe people who are coordinating the event? I don't know who that might be. Maybe that was you. Maybe that that's somebody in a different position. And local police. Is everyone in communications with each other? Are we going through different levels, whereas, you know, the agents on the ground have somebody relaying information to them from police? How does the communication work? Are we all using headsets and microphones, which I assume, given my experience in the military, that's what would be done. But please fill everybody in on how information could have been relayed because there are videos that I can't confirm myself, of course, where they line up with the the two-minute video where they say this is how much time they had to react between people pointing out the, the shooter on the roof and Trump's speech and, and seeing the bullets on camera. What is the communication like between the agents, local law enforcement, and so forth during a, a rally like this? Well, I, I want to commend you, first of all, for the question. And, and of all the interviews that I've done about this, you're the very first one to, to ask me about that. It's insightful, and, and I credit your military training for that. So thank you. Uh, the communication is, is so key, and it, it's what can save the day. And so part of the advanced effort by the Secret Service is to set up a, a, a plan for communication. Because, as, you know, what you saw, in the midst of chaos, communication doesn't work very well. But the communication ahead of time can work very well. And so the Secret Service will uh, set up a command post. And that command post would be staffed not only with Secret Service, but with every other law enforcement agency that is participating in the security plan. And and communication is what's supposed to happen there. And ideally, you would receive, if, if, if agents and officers working in tandem, which is what we like, uh, were on the ground out in front of that building uh, who encounter a man with a gun, uh, that would be communicated twice one by the Secret Service and one by the officer or detective that's out there so that the command post has the information they need to then relay that to the working shift, to the snipers, to the counter assault team, to all the entities that need to know that information and, and, and do what they've been trained to do. Now there's another video circulating about the shooter walking around about an hour before everything went down, I think it was. Don't quote me on the exact time. Would you categorize that in and of itself as another failure of not noticing a person? Or are we at that point, you know, really splitting hairs because there's lots of people walking around? Or would you say that not noticing somebody seemingly surveying the rooftops, I don't know if you've seen seen the video, would you consider that a failure to not notice somebody doing that? Or is that actually just too difficult to be able to, to point out? Well, that's what those teams are out there to do is to is to spot the the duck amongst the geese you know that that's the way i like to look at it is you know you're out there looking for what doesn't belong and and certainly if you have somebody uh in a trench coat on a hot day uh there's something wrong and you go talk to that individual if you see someone behaving erratically or um you know like you said I, i've not seen the video but you know someone with a with a spotting scope or uh you know anything else like that um, it's unusual. It doesn't mean it's bad, but you go check it out. You go ask them, hey, what you doing here today? And, you know, can we help you? And, um, you know, it's not even unusual for us to encounter people getting up on rooftops, but you go check it out. You know, you have a, a team that's dedicated to going to rooftops to, to talk to people who either open windows in venues that are that are overlooking the event happens all the time. You go check it out. If you get someone up on a rooftop most of the time. 99 times out of 100, that's a that's a civilian who is in the wrong place at the wrong time, but they're curious. They want to see. They're taking pictures. They're looking through binoculars. And that happens. We deal with it. But you have a plan to deal with it, and it looks like to me that that plan was, was not executed upon. I'll show you the video just for your knowledge here, and maybe you have something to say. It's very short. And, of course, we don't know. This is from the post-millennial, an outlet that you may or may not uh, be familiar with, but th I would consider them to be generally credible, but um, you never know this sort of stuff. So it says an hour plus before the shooting, Crooks is walking around the building and looking up. That would be him right there. It's a really short video. We'll watch it again. See, I don't know. It looks like there's a baseball game going on there, and I, I, I would think that it's very hard to tell, but if you're telling me that it's... You know, somebody's job, they sh or it should be their job to, you know, look 
be on the lookout for something. I think this is just another piece of the puzzle that people are going to say and say there's something suspicious about this. Would you go, and there have been other people, so I don't want to act like you're you're going to be, uh, you know, lambasted as being the only person to suggest something, but would you go as far to say that you think something suspicious happened? You know, whether it's uh, inside information, a tip-off, help. People are saying the word help, and uh, we don't. nobody wants to, to say what that might might mean. Is there anything that you want to add in there that people might not be thinking of? Well, the the area outside the the established security perimeter is a is a fluid area. You can be out there without going through a magnetometer or uh, any kind of, of of overt security screening, but you're still under surveillance. And you, you 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 know we use helicopters, we use counter surveillance teams, we use identification teams to be in that area to to monitor the crowd because. You know, even a, a vehicle with a with a high speed avenue of approach should be is something that they're kind of on the lookout for. So um, that area outside the perimeter is uh, it, it's not no man's land. It's it's it should be somewhat saturated with law enforcement to to make sure that nobody gains access to high ground that's been pre-identified uh, uh, by an advance. And the, the very fact that we had snipers, Secret Service counter snipers. Um, at the event means that they did in advance. They went out and looked at those buildings. They numbered those buildings. They range found those buildings to see how far is that and is it in play. And so they they knew this building well, I assure you. And and you know that had to be in play for a a uh, counter surveillance team to be on the lookout for. So um, yeah, everything's in play there. But every every day the security architecture around an event site is unique and it's different. So I, d I wish I had more specifics about that, but um, but but that that should have still been prevented. Now, uh, one other thing that people are looking at the videos and saying they're seeing these female secret uh, secret service agents and they're pointing out two of them. Now, I should note for the people who haven't seen, there are two other female ser secret service agents, one of which was on top of the president as they were escorting him out. And what I'm trying to say is we can't blame just the fact that they were female, but they see these this video of the other women and they immediately start thinking of, you know, diversity hires and equity inclusion programs. Do you think that this has become a factor? Not counting these individual women, we don't. I think that it's unfair to know what was going on in their mind or even you know, assume why they were hired, right? But in general, do you think that the Secret Service is, you know, falsely applying these diversity principles and that it has uh, the possibility of affecting on-the-ground operations? Do you think that DEI hiring is a problem in the Secret Service now? Or is this just something that, you know, requires so much training and so much background checked and, and so much looking into a person's capabilities that that's pretty much not possible? Well, I think, you know, my, my personal opinion is that we shouldn't use quotas. And I, I don't know what the, you know, if they're using quotas uh, to, to mandate certain types of hires. I know hiring has been a challenge and the, the standards by which the Secret Service uses for hiring has changed over the years. And for instance, drugs, uh, when I came in, you, you, you could not have tried or experimented with any kind of drugs. And you took a polygraph to determine if you were telling the truth when you said, that you hadn't tried any drugs, and and that was just a that was a, a a line of fault for the Secret Service, and if you crossed it, you were out. You didn't get in. Um, you know, today it's it's different. Those standards are different. Um, but regardless of 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 how they're hired, of how they're recruited, uh, two things. Number one, they all have to go through the training, and if the training standards have changed, then that's a problem because on the day of of, of of having to react to bullets flying, uh, everyone's under the same gun. You know, they're facing the same bullets and they're facing the same challenges of a, of a very tall and uh, robust protectee that's got to be lifted and carried and, and knocked down. And and so those those training standards are, are what are critically key to me. And then um, the other thing that I would say is that, uh, that at least during my tenure, uh, there were there were several many plenty of, of female secret service agents there were uh, tall ones and short ones and and uh, they all were required to pass a physical fitness test 
uh, men and women had different standards, and a lot of people took issue with that. Uh, but I served with some of the most outstanding uh, females uh, that you could meet. Uh, I, I mean, one of them was number 11 in the world in Krav Maga. And, uh, you know, you talk about a butt kicking uh, Secret Service agent, she could put a whooping on just about anybody. So, you know, I, I don't know what else to say about DEI. I, I think um, if the priority of the Secret Service is focused on uh, where we're going to go in terms of, of, uh, of a mandated um, number of females, that's a mistake. I, I want to hire people who are in it for the mission that are, are qualified and capable to carry out the mission. And to me, that's a, that's a much higher priority. And, and um, that's, what, that's what leadership focus should be on. Something else I wanted to ask you about in more of a general sense is we're also hearing about this shooter that the, the parents called the police on him with concerns one time. And what we've seen in, in several of the school shootings, for example, is, is what seems to be a failure to act on credible calls uh, about somebody who, you know, a loose cannon, they're dangerous, whatever it might be. My question to you is, is you hear a lot about, you know, like a rapper says something bad about the president and, they, and the Secret Service gets sent after them. How many uh, check-in calls, I'm not sure the exact, uh, the exact terminology, maybe you can tell me, but how many of those check-ins with people lead to arrests? Is there like a certain ballpark percentage you can put on it? And I think they should happen if we're asking my opinion, which nobody is, but I think they should happen. I think there's a reason definitely why they are done. How often do those, you know, uh, procedures where they go and check on somebody based on something they've said or done lead to an arrest or some sort of credible, credible information to, towards a crime? Yeah. I, I don't know about percentages. I can tell you that the secret service interviews someone no doubt daily for making threats against uh, one of our protectees, and it is a federal crime. Uh, the question is, are, are the uh, prosecutors and the courts willing to prosecute them for that? And so we, we go out and, and interview people. A lot of times there's, there are uh, mental problems with these people, um, and they, they have medications that, that they typically are not taking that need to be uh, taken. And so we do go out and interview people who make credible threats uh, and the determination has to be made whether that, whether or not that was credible and then whether or not they're going to be prosecuted and, and locked up is uh, is a, another question and if it's if it's determined to be a mental illness then what we're looking at is whether or not they seem to have the ability to carry out the threat that they're making and you know if they're in prison making threats then then we're probably not going to be arresting them but we would see if the if the US attorney would would indict them add to their charges keep them in prison longer uh, if they are um, you know have training for example or uh, they're well equipped with infrastructure to travel and have weapons and and uh, means to do that then we're looking at a different story and, and we would want to affect an arrest on that person for the threat that they are um, need to face charges for and then ensure that, that they do get charged and, and prosecuted for that. Um, but it's a daily occurrence for the Secret Service. It's something that we do take very seriously. And, and we're looking for a, a behavioral assessment. And so it's a behavioral threat, uh, just like with schools. You know, the Secret Service puts out a a terrific piece of, of information every year about school uh, shootings, and it is a threat-based model of, of, of investigation and, and look into uh, the mind of, of people who do that kind of thing, but um, it's a great resource and it's free online. Did your time in the Secret Service change the way you felt about politicians? Because obviously you're talking about serving for Republicans and Democrats alike as the president, did it change your perspective on how politicians, you know, are perceived by the public? Did it make you, um, you know, did it give you a greater appreciation for how difficult the job is or did it change your perspective on political leadership in the United States in any way, do you think? I don't think it did. I, you know, I came into the job uh, not concerned with politics, uh, I certainly get out and vote. And uh, my wife is not above putting a political sign in our yard. But for me personally and professionally, that, that never really played into it. I, I served with President 
Clinton and then made the transition, stayed in the White House for President Bush and then agreed to come back with President Obama. So, you know, we you elect them, we protect them. That shouldn't really play into it at all. And, you know, certainly you're going to have uh, favorite moments with different protectees and, and perspective on some of their personal life. But uh, it doesn't change the mission and it doesn't change your mindset. And I, and I would speak broadly for for all Secret Service agents that uh, that, you know, if that ever came into that mindset, then it's time to go because that that shouldn't be a part of it ever. Yeah, I'm glad you have that perspective. And I and I wish that in all forms of law enforcement and government, we could have that perspective, especially now where it seems like people are a little bit more lenient or um, willing to to not have that perspective, to allow a bias to play into to their role. You mentioned 9-11. I want to ask you more about that as an ex- the experience from your eyes. You know, when that happens, when that sort of thing happens, how much surety is there in your mind that everything's going to plan because something i've been talking about with friends recently around this assassination is that maybe this idea that there is supreme protection around the president or supreme protection around these politicians maybe there's a bit of theater to that and the idea that it's an impossible task to take a shot at the president is what deters so many people are you confident in saying that there is actually an extreme level that is, if all systems are firing properly, that is extremely hard to pre- uh, to penetrate? Or do you think that there can always be improvements? I know that there can always be improvements, but how far do you think that the, the, the security detail around national security events like this, how much more can it improve, do you think? Do you see what I'm saying? I do. And, and you know, I, I would speak to both ends of that and say that there's always going to be risk. I mean, you, you cannot eliminate all risk. But the, the mission, the, the privilege and the responsibility of the Secret Service is to is to prevent. And when when someone that you've been assigned to protect leaves the stage uh, being carried off with a with bleeding from a gunshot wound, then then, you know, you that failed. I mean, that that mission to prevent has failed. And the heroics that were on display are, are evident. You know, the, the shift that reacted to those bullets in the air, they did a great job. They were very fast and they covered. You know, they, they did exactly what they're supposed to do. They reacted to the sound of gunfire. They covered and then they evacuated. And, and then the snipers uh, did what snipers do. And they, they you know, one shot, one kill. Um, I don't think that, that our snipers have ever fired on, a, on another human being in, in the history of the Secret Service. So um, they, they dealt effectively in reaction. But again, it, it, this, is, this should be about prevention. And that's where we want to live is, is on the island of prevention so that we don't have to react. Because reaction is, uh, is, is so risky. It's so iffy. It's, uh, you know, it, 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 bad things can tend to happen. So, so I want to live in the, in, in the realm of prevention. And, and there's so many things that, that can be done that should be done. I think um, when, when you talk about the, the national special security events, for example, um, those are very few. There are a few designated every year. The, the RNC, the DNC are among them. The United Nations General Assembly is one. The inauguration is one. Um, and those are planned and coordinated for a full year in advance. And I, and I oversaw the division that, that, that arranges those uh, leading up to my retirement in 2020. And, and those are, are extremely collaborative, extremely detailed. Uh, an event like what you saw in Butler uh, gets maybe a week to, to plan and to coordinate. But Secret Service, in, in my experience, is extremely collaborative. And we don't roll into... A, a town anywhere in the world and say, we're here and we're in charge and we're going to take care of this. We roll in and with our hat in our hand to say, we're here, here's the mission ahead of us. We're a tiny little agency and we need your help. And that is, that's the, that's the posture that we go into these events with. And then through that collaborative effort, that's the, that was the joy of being a Secret Service agent was to say, hey, we don't have all the answers, but we do have this mission and we're responsible for the mission. Will you help? And we get the greatest help in the world. I, 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 I'm very reluctant to say that, that anyone in particular failed. I think Secret Service has to own what happened the other day. 
and let's work to the conclusion about what exactly failed and and address it. And my suspicion is that, uh, to your question, the, the methodology is solid. The methodology has worked time and time again, and the execution is the problem. And so if it wasn't executed properly, if the infrastructure and the resources were not present that day because either they weren't asked for, they weren't available, whatever the cause, uh, you, you've got to pinpoint that and say, we can't have that moving forward. You can't do without what you need to do the job and do it right. Yeah, you definitely say you can't have that happen again. Do you think there's going to be a call for for greater funding or, or an expansion of the Secret Service or something like that after this? Do you think they're going to somebody internally is going to say we need uh, more resources? Oh, I think you're going to hear that. And, you know, frankly, I, I think the Secret Service has been understaffed and underfunded for a long time. When when we made the transition from Treasury Department, where I started, to DHS, uh, it, it's been a rough relationship, honestly. And, and so from my perspective, um, that started uh, the, the pyramid of DHS. And, and uh, you can still find the diagram online. Uh, there was a pyramid and all the law enforcement agencies were at the very bottom of that pyramid. The Secret Service was outside the pyramid a answering directly to the top of DHS. And and that was the last we saw of that. And the Secret Service got pushed to the bottom of the pyramid where we're scrapping for resources and funding. And it's hard for me to believe that that our mission is, is um, you know, a, a focus or a priority for DHS. Uh, I'm still looking for the leaked memo where the DHS secretary says to the to the Secret Service director, hey, we've got your back no matter what. We we pledge our support and the resources and the funding and whatever you need to do your mission and to do it right, we're behind you and you've got it. You tell us what you need. Uh, I don't think you're going to find that memo. I'd like to see it too. Um, one more thing I want to ask you about, which I read about you, is uh, your faith. And I wanted to ask you, since... So many, I think there's this growing movement now where whether it's football player, politician, um, you know, musician, people are willing to express their, their religion more and more in public now. And even in places where it's not typically expressed. And, and by that, I mean, after a UFC victory or after a football game or be, when they get an award, you know, before I think it was a little bit more hollow, but now I think you're seeing people really express themselves in that nature. And I think that's good. And I want to ask you how much of that contributes to how you're, you know, how you're going into your life nowadays. Whereas, you know, as you mentioned, all the integrity you had in, in Secret Service, not wanting to show bias. And I'm sure you weren't showing up, you know, a preaching to people at work. Maybe you were. But how much of it is affecting your life now? And do you see a shift in, in public acceptance of religious expression? Well, uh, great question. And I appreciate you asking that because uh, on May 2nd of 1990, that's when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Uh, I was in law school at the time, and and uh, that was a hard-fought decision, I think, by the, by God uh, being patient with me. <laughs> and, um, and ever since then, I have sought to follow uh, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I did not show up to work at the White House every day preaching. Uh, I did not wear my faith on my sleeve. I, I you know, answered the questions and tried to speak truth into the into the situations of life that that presented themselves to me. And certainly on 9-11, had more opportunity to share my faith. And um, on the night of 9-11, when we effected that evacuation, um, there was there was one person who had to cover the evacuation with a with a machine gun and then stay behind and, and face that airplane. And that was me. And I did it with utter peace, knowing that uh, what was going to happen to me in death was uh, that I was going to cheat death and, and have eternal life with Jesus Christ. So, you know, I, 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 I try to live by faith. I, I try to speak my faith as opportunities present themselves. And, and that is what the book is really about. Cheating death is about not only protecting the life of the president and, and ensuring that, you know, the person that the U.S. Uh, population elected gets to do the job that, that they were elected to do, but also speaks to my personal life where uh, I believe that, that in death you, you skip from death to life eternal with Christ. So uh, in the general public, I, I 
to me, it looks like there is a, a growing divide. And, um, you know, you're, you do see a lot more people coming forward, talking about their faith. You mentioned UFC. It's so funny to see these guys bleeding afterwards, thanking, you know, God for, for a great fight and a, and a victory, that kind of thing. But um, so I, I'm certainly enjoying that and welcome that pro football players, basketball, what have you. Um, but it, it does seem like um, that is a, a very vocal minority in our country. And, and so I, of course, uh, invite people to follow Christ and, and ask me about it. I'll be glad to tell them about it. Now, I, I can't let you go without asking about what you just mentioned there with the machine gun. Where, where was that and what building was that? Was it in the White House, you're saying? Yeah, that was in the White House the night of 9-11 when we got the report that there was a, a another plane headed for D.C. specifically for the White House. It was on a exact trajectory at high speed. Um, we, we implemented and effected an evacuation uh, of the president and the first lady that night. Um, not talked about much in media, and I've been reluctant to talk about that until more recently. I talk about it in the book, but... Um, the, the protocol that was in place at that time was that uh, one person, and, and it was dictated by where you were when the call went out to evacuate, um, the, we, we tend to send maximum to the protectee and minimum to the problem. And so the protocol uh, really based more on a ground attack, but we evacuated. Uh, my friend Jeff led the team, made the decision to evacuate, and, uh, and I, my job <coughs> was to cover that evacuation and then stay. And, um, and as we know, it was, an, it was an aircraft and not a ground attack, but it was not, not a great time to argue the protocol. So I stayed behind and, and had a moment to think about uh, what was about to happen, having watched airplanes hit buildings all day long on the reruns of, 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 of World Trade Center and the Pentagon. So I was, I was very certain that, uh, that that was my last day, that that was my last minute and uh, had great peace about that. Uh, was able to pray for my wife and and my daughter at the time, uh, in hopes that the Lord would provide them a, a better husband and a better father uh, after me. And um, and then the call came that uh, that it was actually an Air Force jet that was headed to D.C. to relieve uh, the the fighter jets uh, out at Andrews, but he was on the wrong frequency and and didn't have his transponder turned on. So uh, he got a pretty big wake up call that night. He came a lot closer to dying than I did. But of course, I didn't know that at the time. So it was, uh, you know, in retrospect, great experience for me just to know that peace and to know that that uh, you do believe it deep down. And, and that's what won that night. What was the first thing you thought of when you got that call that it was one of your own and not a terrorist plane is what I'm not a hijacked plane? What was the first, you get that call what was the first thing you thought after that? The, the first thing I thought was we've, we've got to affect a, a re-entry of the president and the first lady back to the White House and get them back. Wow. <laughs> I don't remember thinking too much else uh, at that time. I know there was relief and, you know, there, there was no there wasn't a lot of joking and laughter that night. Uh, I think everyone was exhausted from the, the events of the day and just watching, you know, America get wrung out. Um, and I was no exception to that, but uh, so much frustration and, and uh, really anger over what was happening to our country and, and wishing you could do more uh, to have prevented or stop that. And, you know, who are we going to go get for it? Um, but, uh, you know, it's all very practical thinking that night. So I, I, I think when the call came, it was all right, let's let's reset and uh, and get back to business. Tougher than most, Kenneth. Tougher than almost everybody, I would say. Cheating death, three-time presidential Secret Service agent lives to tell you how. Of course, I don't want them to buy the Kindle version. Buy the hardcover version. There we go. <laughs> On Amazon and everywhere else. Thanks a lot, Kenneth. This was really insightful, and I know a lot of people are going to want to hear what you had to say about the shooting. And uh, best of luck with everything around the book, okay? Thank you for having me. Starting out with straight facts. Uh -huh. I don't lie in my raps. Uh -huh. Hunter Biden smoke. Uh -huh. The Democrats know that. Uh -huh. Biden ain't win jack. Uh -huh. The name is Barack.